All right, everyone. We are going to start the next session now. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Professor Sarah Walker. She's a deputy director of Beyond Center for Fundamental Concepts in Science at Arizona State and also the associate director for ASU Center for Institute Center for Bio Biosocial Complex Systems. So Sarah is a great speaker. So yeah, this should be interesting. Go ahead, Sarah. Thank you so much, Avi. Um, so um, yeah, I was just um, saying that I'm really thrilled about um, participating in this workshop this week because this is one of my favorite topics and I'm very excited about uh, the community that's been emerging after the techno signatures report and getting to be a part of that. So that's super cool. Um, and also just getting to learn more about the long heritage of techno signatures. Um, so I come at this um, slightly from a different perspective because I've mostly been thinking throughout my career about origins of life and the physics underlying living processes. Um, but I think that there is a continuity between what biology and technology are. And so I'm really interested in exploring that um, with the work that my group's doing and just want to talk about some of those ideas today because I think um, there's a lot of potential avenues uh, for collaboration um, and exciting ideas to be developed that we're starting to work on um, and would really love to get feedback from the community and also uh, other directions that might be of interest to pursue. So I want to just um, start with um, sort of thinking about what life is um, more broadly and also um, what techno signatures are and how we think about technology and intelligence fitting into that um, scheme. And so um, sometimes when I give talks about physics of life, it's very surprising to people when I say that there might be um, things that the universe can produce only because of intelligence or technology that wouldn't be producible in the absence of um, that kind of process. Um, so there are really obvious examples um, like um, elements on the periodic table that we know are only reliably produced by technology or um, launching of satellites into space, which we certainly know that planets could anti-accrete, but wouldn't do so rely as reliably as our planet does without technology on the surface. So that's not surprising um, to the techno signatures community um, necessarily, but I do think um, that when we're thinking about physics of life, we need to take these kind of ideas that there are certain things that the universe can produce only because of intelligence very seriously and thinking about what the underlying principles are. Um, and approaching that problem, um, really that there's actually two concepts that need to be disentangled. And one of them is tightly related to this problem of biosignatures. And the other is thinking about what life actually is. Um, so I wrote this essay um, with my colleague, um, Michael Lockman at Santa Fe Institute about a year ago now, um, trying to think about physics of life from sort of a first principles perspective and disentangling um, uh, two related but distinct concepts, which are the concept of life versus alive. And so the argument that we made in that essay is that life is the set of all the objects that require something like an information processing system or a living system to produce them. And alive things are the things that are actually actively doing that process. So the constructors of the information processing systems. And so this is quite interesting because um, it's kind of the same old discussion that the biosignatures and technosignatures community has been having for a long time about searching for artifacts, which we just say, you know, all the things that life could produce are life um, versus actually looking for the active processes that are doing that. Um, and so I think this is actually um, critically important though for talking about whether or not there actually are artifacts or features of life that are um, so apparent that they must be produced by a living or intelligent process that they don't actually have any susceptibility to false positives. Um, so one of the ideas um, that we've been exploring is really that this idea of um, life not being this sort of binary categorization of nature, that something's not alive or alive, but instead that life is this kind of um, missing physics that describes how information operates in the physical world gives some new um, and interesting insights on in how to think about life as a continuum of processes. And that once you transition into this kind of physics um, at the origin of life, as we call it, um, that you um, have an increasing uh, hierarchy of processes that are actually um, related to how information is constructing properties of the physical world. And that some of these artifacts that get produced are very apparently biological or technological. Um, now the question for astrobiology that we need to, to really grapple with is whether we could 
agnostically come up with theories or predictors of what these kind of artifacts of this kind of process would be, and whether it's actually possible to distinguish different phases of evolution from abiotic to biological to technological. And so my perspective on it is that there really are some things, as I was saying before, that the universe does not produce unless you've had this transition of an original life into what I would call living physics. And, um, and then you have this kind of cascade of information processing starting to structure matter across space and time, which is what we call the biosphere. And then you evolve into all of these um, more quote unquote complex structures. Um, and that biological things um, can produce things that abiotic systems can't and technological systems can produce things that biological systems can't. Um, so Eddie had this really nice talk this morning already um, about some of the directions that have been discussed in exoplanet biosignatures. And my talk is also closely related to some of those ideas. So I'm really um, glad that he did such an excellent review of that this morning. Um, the main point I want to point out with this is when we're thinking about these kind of three domains and whether we could distinguish them or not, that really we're going to have to start talking about um, statistical assessments for life detection and techno signatures because it's not always going to be apparent whether something was most likely to be produced by a living process or a non-living process. And the way we talk about this in physics of life is really um, that part of the problems um, in trying to understand what life is is that we don't um, really see life violating any of the known laws of physics or chemistry. Um, so it's not like uh, life is going against anything that we know so far. What life seems to do is harness those laws and do that and control those processes to produce new outcomes. And so one way of thinking about it is that actually what the physics of life is doing is manipulating probability distributions to make really rare things um, not rare. <laughs> Um, so things that you would never expect to see in the universe, you actually do expect to see if there's a living process there or an intelligent process. Um, so all of that's a little bit abstract um, and philosophical, but I do think that there are ways to think about it rather concretely. Um, and the most concrete place that we can think about is actually to think about it in terms of chemical space. Because um, chemistry um, is interestingly enough the scale of reality that life emerges from um, and also has sufficient diversity um, of structures and objects um, to really start to ask um, quantitative questions about what it is that life is doing that might not be accounted for by traditional uh, physics and chemistry. Um, and so one of the questions that um, my group has been asking a lot is about what are the um, statistical patterns that characterize life in chemical space. And so one way I think about it is um, there are literally uh, <laughs> billions of molecules. Um, there's more molecules. Um, I think a, a rough estimate of just, you know, like very small molecules that contain just schnapps elements is that there's probably about 10 to the 60 of them. Um, and you can compare that just to the 10 to the 80 atoms in the universe. But certainly when you get up to the scale of things like um, proteins or ribosomes, there are so many variations of those molecules that it's not possible for the universe to ever produce them. Um, so there is certainly a boundary, and it seems to be at a very sort of low molecular weight and low complexity, above which um, there's just not enough stuff in the universe to make a lot of things in that combinatorial space. And so, um, so if you actually do studies of chemical space and what kind of molecules have been discovered, um, most molecules of very um, low number of atoms and low molecular weight um, we find in high abundance. As you start to increase molecular weight or increase complexity of molecules, we start to see that trailing off. And there seems to be some kind of um, potential boundary in chemical space where you actually really need some process that has some knowledge about how to make a molecule to actually be able to produce that molecule. Um, and there might be even another boundary where that knowledge has to be um, so exact that you actually really need something that we would call intelligence or technology to produce that molecule. And those might be pharmaceutical things like taxol um, or very complex molecules that we know technology can produce. The reason I'm pointing this out at a techno signatures conference is I think that we talk about these kind of things with objects like Dyson spheres or um, computers or other things, um, but it's very hard to iterate over the possible objects um, when you get to things of our everyday experience. I don't know what the space of all possible books is. I don't know what the space of all possible um, uh, Dyson sphere type objects is, but I can talk about concretely the space of all possible molecules. And so it allows me to meaningful ask questions about what is it that biology or technology can do that um, other physics can't. Um, and so um, we can think about this um, uh, rather concretely in terms of talking about um, 
biosignatures and technosignature science in the sense that exoplanet science has traditionally approached the problem, which is to ask if there's molecules uniquely producible by life. Um, we know that our canonical exoplanet biosignatures are not uniquely producible. That's obviously the problem of false positives. So oxygen, for example, we know can be produced by light, but also abiotic processes. Um, but there are some candidate molecules um, like phosphine that's been proposed um, by Clara Sousa Silva and, um, and Sarah Seeger's group that might be uniquely produced by life and not produced um, on terrestrial worlds that don't have living processes. Um, but I think to really concretely say that, you know, if you're thinking about leveraging exoplanet science um, to look for techno signatures, that we really need to start pushing toward, are there molecules that we think technology could produce only? Or um, if those are too complex to actually be um, abundant in the atmosphere and remotely detectable, can we instead transition to studying statistical patterns and dis distributions of properties that might distinguish life from non-life and then life from technology? So the hypothesis here is that living systems, by virtue of the process of this evolutionary process I was describing before, actually change the distributions in the properties and interactions of molecules and reaction networks, and that we might be able to look for those statistical imprints, and that technology does that even further. Um, and so there's a couple ways of talking about this that we can use insights from complex system science and systems chemistry um, and also um, systems biology to think about. And so I'm just going to give a couple concrete examples on the quantitative side for this. I know I'm going to run out of time, so I have a couple minutes left. Um, so one of them is this idea of using um, pathway assembly, or also known as molecular assembly, theory to actually talk about the complexity of individual molecules. And the idea behind this um, uh, proposal, which was de developed by Leroy Cronin's group at University of Glasgow, is to actually um, count the number of ways of making a molecule or breaking a molecule. And then that actually becomes sort of a complexity number associated with that molecule. And the way that we actually iterate um, over production of molecules in this theory is actually to go by the number of bonds in the molecules. So it can actually map to mass, mass spec measurements. And so um, what the Cronin group um, has done is actually demonstrated that this um, chemical complexity measure is strongly correlated with um, features that you'll observe in a mass spec. And so they can measure it directly um, from experimental data. And what they've been able to show, um, and this is preliminary data shown in the right from their group, um, is that if you look at abiotic, biotic versus um, biological distributions, only the biological distribution um, or the biological systems that they've tested so far have been able to reach these high complexity molecules. And so there seems to be some kind of threshold in chemical space at, at an assembly of about 15, above which only biological systems can produce molecules. But for technosignature science, what I wanted to point out is that this distribution also drops off. And so um, one hypothesis is that if you want to get actually even farther along this complexity axis, um, that you actually need something like technology or a system with more intelligence and more ability to manipulate and control physical systems to actually be able to get into that complexity um, space. So we might actually be able to use this as a um, detection measure that is also flight ready because it just uses standard mass spec experiment um, uh, to, to be able to measure that. Um, we also can think about trying to measure it from spectral data, which I'm happy to talk about later. Um, I also want to point out this idea of networks. Um, so my group has done a lot of work trying to determine whether the patterns and the reactions that life uses are different from non-life, and we have a lot of work that we've done demonstrating that that might be the case. Um, and so network theory is another sort of promising route for thinking about the patterns that might um, distinguish life from non-life. Um, and part of the reason that this is kind of a promising um, avenue is that um, there is so much data available now in chemical databases and bioinformatic databases about what kind of molecules, reactions, and compounds um, are um, actually used by life. Um, and so this also gets into databases of technologically produced molecules because there's a huge 
industry of people that want to try to predict properties of chemical space for drug design. And so there's this field called cheminformatics where people study um, properties of molecules in chemical space. Um, and so what's shown here is rather than the biosphere network, which I showed on the previous slide, which included compounds and reactions that life uses, this um, network, which is sampled from the Reaxis database, um, includes technologically produced compounds. And so one of the things that we're trying to do is parse out what kinds of parts of chemical space are only abiotic available versus biologically versus technologically and then to go to the level of thinking about the patterns in the molecules not just what specific molecules they are that might actually um, give us some new techno signatures um, I'm going I'm over time so I'm actually going to skip the last part of my talk because Tessa Fisher's here and she can talk about how we actually go from observables to networks um, uh, for her poster so I encourage you all to visit her there and I want to make sure we have time for other talks so I'm just going to um, thank my group for being amazing um, and our funders and supporters and also um, just point to Tessa Fisher um, and Hikaru Furukawa who are two grad students in my group that are at the workshop this week and Sierra Foote who's an undergrad. Um, all of them have really exciting ideas and are very enthusiastic about this field so please talk to them. Thank you.